Good morning. We'll start our first session by introducing the speaker for the morning session. The title of his presentation is Base Reproductive Development and Canal Set Under Limited Plant Growth Environments. So welcome Lucas Barros from Universidad Nacional de Rosario, Argentina. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Today, um, thanks for coming this early after all the dancing last night. So today I'm gonna to talk about maize reproductive development and kernel set under reduced plant growth conditions. And I want you to start with a picture about the drought stress uh, crop just before flowering so that we can understand what happens around flowering a little bit. And this is just a picture to show you, you know, that the crop has uh, less plant turgor, less photosynthesis, there's a lot of leaf rolling, less light interception, and of course, many other things, but for sure there's a lot that plant growth is being reduced around flowering. Um, this is one of the main important things, at least for me. So why are we talking about uh, around the flowering period? It's because this is the most susceptible part uh, of the crop cycle um, for yield susceptibility. So any drought stress around that period, um, yield is very, very, let's say, susceptible. And that is, the, is what we call the kernel set period, and it's around the flowering period. And why am I talking about the kernel set period? Because if you go and you see yield components, kernel number, the number of kernels that we harvest at maturity is very related to yield. So whenever you have a drought, for example, kernel number goes down and yield goes down. And I'm not saying that kernel size is, kernel size is not important because I've been, I've been working with kernel size for a long time, but, but the main yield component is kernel number. So what happens around flowering is critical for having more or less kernels and having more or less yield. Now, for a long time, um, we've known, well, long time, I don't know, like 20, 10, 20 years, we've known that the number of kernels that we harvest is very related to how much the plants are growing around flowering, how much the crop is growing around flowering. And if you go and you check for most of the agronomic practices that we do, they are, they are for, they are always trying to increase crop growth around flowering for maximizing the number of kernels and maximizing the yield at the end of the season, okay? Now, I was, I was invited to talk about um, reproductive development, so I, I so uh, before that, I need to give a couple of, you know, a couple of uh, definitions. First, the maize plant has a, has a male flower uh, that is called the tassel, the liberate pollen, and in the middle of the plant, we have a, an ear, that has silks, and the pollen has to travel to the silk to pollinate the ovary. This is, this is basic, uh, you know, uh, reproductive development for, for maize. And why are we talking about this, um, about this um, in maize and drought? It's because under drought, um, there's, um, there's a shift in female flowering respect to the male flowering. So you have here, you know, a well water condition in which the male and the female flowering are mostly Match and whenever you have a severe drought stress, the the time to silking is delayed, and what happens is that there's there's a there's a time gap between the male flowering and the female flowering. Okay, so the, that is what we call traditionally what we call the ASI, the antithesis to silking interval. That has been also known for a very long time. I think the the first studies that describe this are from the early 80s. Um, the second thing that we have learned is that if you go and you throw fresh pollen to those late appear, late appearing female flowers, they will not give a kernel. So, so well, that, that's more or less a little bit what happens around flowering. Breeders have also known this, not only the physiologists, but the breeders have also known this for, for a long time. And this is because whatever delays the female flowering respect to the male flowering, whenever they see that, they also see a yield reduction. And this is this is a, a figure coming from coming from um, from a breeding program from Pioneer. Okay, so what I want to emphasize the, is that whenever there's reduced plant growth, there's a delay in time to female flowering, a delay in time to silking. But this we don't see this only under drought. We see this under any condition that reduces plant growth. That means a defoliation around flowering. That means reduced nitrogen. That means reduced radiation. This is just an example. 
about what I'm talking about. This is, you know, a control and two defoliation levels, very severe defoliation levels. And you can see this is tasseling, that would be the male flowering. And antisis for the three conditions is, is not really changed. This is time. While silking, you can see that the control reaches silking at one time point and under gro reduced growth conditions, um, time to silking is delayed. And also there's a lot of plants that never reach silking under very severe defoliations that reduce light interception and reduce canopy growth. Um, so having said that, what I'm going to present today is how do we connect changes in crop ear growth to a functional relationship with ASI? The functional relationship between the, the difference in time between the antisis and the silk and the interval. And I'm going to focus specifically in two things. How to connect time to silking with plant growth. And then the rate, I'm going to talk about certain things about how the, how the silks grow and how, what is the rate of silk appearance and how, how important that is. Okay. Now, one thing I want to, want to mention is that I will dissect the trait and the silking interval coming from how much the plants are growing so that we present different functional relationships that lead to specific parameters to, to define going from plant growth to time to silking and ASI. Okay? So the first thing that we need to understand is that silking is a qualitative trait at the plant level. And this is, this is very important. So a plant has or has not reached silking. This is just a one genotype yeah, that I took some pictures. We, we define silking as, or, or female flowering as, one silk out of the husk. That is uh, what we call time silking, or, or female flowering. There's no silking here, so it, this is no, this is yes. And this is at the plant level. Any plant has or has not reached silking is like germination. There's a, the seed has a radical out, it, it has germinated. If it doesn't, it's not. Now, at the canopy level, it's different. It's not, a, it's not a qualitative trait, it's a quantitative trait. So at the plant level is no, or at some point in, in time, it's yes. Now at the stand, at the canopy level, it's a proportion of plants. Plants, you know, 20% of plants had rich silking, 50% had rich silking, 80%. At the canopy level, we call time to, flower, time to silking or time to female flowering as, as the moment in which 50% of the plants have reached silking. That doesn't mean that all the plants reach silking at the same time, okay? And why am I talking, and am I uh, introducing the concept that the stand is variable and that each individual plant reaches silking at different moments? Because we need to understand that canopies are not uniform. There's there's plant-to-plant -plant variability within canopies, within commercial stands, um, there's plant-to-plant -plant variability. So here, I'm showing you, you know, um, Silking respect to time, it's a, it's a maize canopy. And this is a commercial genotype from the US, uh, grown in, in, in Iowa, grown at a commercial stand density or around a commercial stand density. And you see the average plant growth is around five grams per plant per day. But you see there's variability. Not all the plants are growing at the same rate. The average is five, but then you have plants that are growing at three, four, and there's plants that are the so-called dominated plants. And you have plants that are growing at five, six, well, five is the average, six, seven, eight. Those are the so-called dominant plants within canopy. So canopies are variable. And that impacts in how the canopy reaches silking. I will show you that later. The second thing is that canopies are variable, but not all the plants reach uh, are affected by, by growth equally. So this is another, this is another figure in which it dot it's a particular plant within a maize canopy. And you have time to antisis, time to female uh, male flowering and plant growth, time to silking and plant growth, and you know the difference in days, anti-silking interval and plant growth. This is individual plants. And you see, you know, that antisis is not changed by how much the plants are growing. These are individual plants within a canopy. Now, if you see this figure, you see that the plants. The, the plants that are growing less are the ones that are having problems in reaching female flowering. And that, that affects the, a proportion of plants that have an increased anti-silking interval, okay? So you, you need to understand that there's a variability within the stand and we need to take care about that variability. Not all the plants are reaching silking equally and are not affected equally. And the plants 
within Canopy have different growth rates. Second thing I, I want to mention very quickly is that if you do you know, any experiment with a couple of genotypes, commercial genotypes, not all the genotypes are growing at the same rate for a particular environment, and not all the genotypes are equally uniform at a particular environment, right? right? This, is, this is just an example of, um, of, a, of a study we did. These are all commercial genotypes from Argentina, from the central region. Same environment, and there are some plants that are growing much, much more, and some plants that are growing much less. And also, there are some, plant, some canopies that are intrinsically more uniform, and there are some genotypes that are intrinsically more ununiform, more, more variable. Um, second thing I need, to, I need to introduce to connect you know, plant growth, ear growth, um, and time to silking is the concept that the proportion of biomass that is allocated, that, it, that comes from total plant growth that is allocated in the ear is not uniform. Okay, not uniform across different plant growth. This is in the upper part. You have you know how much a year is growing per day, and in the in the in the x-axis you have much how much the plants are growing per day. The average for this particular genotype is one six. So one six one gram out of total six grams produced by the plant around flowering is going to the ear. Okay. Now if you go and you look at at the at the lower plant growth rates, that are the ones that we explore under stressful situations, that changes a little bit. You know, it goes, well, it doesn't change a little bit, it changes a lot, because it's not 1.6 anymore. If you go to very reduced plant growth, it's not 1.6, it's 1.18, 1 over 18, or even zero. So those, these, these plants here are plants that are growing, but they are allocating the biomass somewhere else. They are not allocating the biomass at the year, okay? This is important, and the other important thing is that genotypes differ in this trait a lot. So these are for these are for inbreds um, that we studied some time ago. This is here biomass at the end of the flowering period, and this is how much plants are growing. As you can see, the nature of, of the relationship is curvilinear that, that we know, but the but then the parameters of the of the relationship are, are the, of the relationship are very different. For example, in this genotype here, in the in the bottom uh, right side, if you if, if if this genotype has uh, some plants that are growing around one gram per day, they are allocating some biomass to the ear. Well, if you go to this bottom left side, this other genotype with one gram per plant per day is absolutely not allocating any biomass in the ear. So the partitioning is of these different genotypes is different, okay? So the, the, the biomass the plants are growing is, 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 is not always intrinsically going to the ear uh, with the same proportion. That's what I want to mean. And this has inconsen important consequences. The curvilinear relationship has important consequences and that the, the curvilinear relationship is not always constant has also important consequences. Um, I'm gonna show here. Here is, you know, three canopies, fraction of the, Three canopies growing at different rates, okay? And this is ear biomass. These two canopies, and this is the curvilinear relationship between plant growth and, and ear growth, how much of the, that biomass is going to the ear. You can see that these two canopies here are growing very differently, but they don't differ that much in how much of, how the, of they, don't, they don't differ that much in the biomass that is allocated to the ear. While this other canopy here is, is, is growing much less and there's a lot of variability. A lot of so ch small changes in, in plant growth around this part of the of the uh, small changes in, in in this part of the curve create large changes in in biomass that is going to the ear. Okay, so that is one part. The second part that I wanted to explain is that you can relate that qualitative change in silking to a specific biomass. This is ear biomass over time. We have discovered that. Uh, there's a particular ear biomass in which the, the, the ear does silking. So the ear is growing within the husk, the ear starts growing, at some point it places a silk out. Well, we realize that we can relate a specific biomass to that, point, to that moment. So this is uh, no or yes, and ear biomass is going this way, and there are plants that are growing from no to yes. And if you go and you check different canopies that are growing at different rates, this is for the same genotype, it's always more or less constant. So you can relate um, 
the time to silking of a particular genotype um, at a particular environment to the moment in which, in which this biomass is reached. Now, having said that, we developed a model to understand all these trade relationships and in which we have, you know, how much the plants are growing, the variability of the stand, what is the, what is the partitioning, and then the moment in which time to silking is reached. And I don't want to bother too much, but with this, but we, we tested this with different environments, different hybrids and inbreds. And this is just um, to show that, that we could predict. First, we could predict 50% silking, and then we could also predict the plant-to-plant -plant variability in time to silking within a canopy. Okay, I, I'm not going to talk about much about that. So I told you I was going to talk about two things. Um, time to silking and canopy growth, and I think I, I, I more or less uh, covered that. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance and the, of how silks appear within an year. Traditionally, crop physiology has, has, has said, you know, you know more, you, you need more plant growth for having more year growth, for having more, for, for having more kernels. Now, pollinated, we have done some experiments in which we disrupted a little bit that. We let all the years come out, and then we pollinated them all together, and suddenly we started having more kernels in the upper part of the year. We realized that there's a dominance within the year, or there's a developmental um, a concept between kernel set within the, with, for kernel set within the year. And, and I, know, I don't want to describe much about this, but, but there's, a, there's a, a concept right now that relates to how many silks are out in three days. We'll tell you those are, th those are silks that will surely give a kernel. The silks that are coming out of the year are mostly, sure, mostly surely aborted um, tissue. They're, they're going to abort. And of course, you can imagine uh, an ear that's having this pattern of silk extrusion will have more late appearance silk that has more late appearance silk will most surely be aborting structures and, and the changes and the, the, the capacity of those late appearance silks for setting kernels is, is very low. And this, this applies not only for silks within an ear, but also for you know the, the time difference between the silking of a, of one year and the time of the silking for the second year. If the second year doesn't reach silking within three days respect to the first one, the chances of giving a kernel is very low. So we, we tested, we, we started talk, uh, working with this, and what we did in the last years is traditionally we have silk number as a, as a function of time, and you have year biomass as a function of time, and there's a moment in which you reach silking. We, we did it a little different. We placed silk number as a function of year biomass accumulation, in which there's a moment in which there's silk in its reach, and then there's accumulation of biomass and silk start to appear. And we like this because we could, we could frame it within, with the other model that was relating, you know, with plant growth, year growth, how much, was the, how much is the year growing. And we used to use it only for time to silking, and we're trying to use it also for how, how year biomass is accumulated and how silks are appearing within that year. This is not new. The people from Pioneer have uh, already published this. This, this, I am, I am not going to explain the whole figure, but I'm, I'm I want to highlight that they, they, they show that dif different genotypes. This is the drought tolerant one, and this is a drought susceptible one. They, they claim that the, the, the drought tolerant one is the one that reaches silking with less, with less uh, ear biomass. So it, it's a, it's a question of efficiency. With less ear. With less year biomass, it, this genotype is already placing some silk, one silk out. Okay, so there's a there's an intrinsic differential efficiency with um, when you compare genotypes. So we tested this. We tested two hypotheses really. One, we tested newer genotypes are more efficient in terms of silk emergence per unit of year biomass, 
and we tested if we could predict kernel number based on the number of, of seals that are that have appeared at a specific time, and this is the, the two, three day time window, okay? And we did this with, G, with some genotypes that were released in different years. This is yield, and this is hybrid release. We have genotypes from 1960, 65 to um, 2015. This is 50 years of breeding. We have um, 32 genotypes. This is the yield gain that we, we, we got from those 32 genotypes growing at four different environments. This, this is, this is the, we did this with DECAL because DECAL is the, the largest seed company in Argentina. Largest maize seed company. Okay, this is what happens when you compare a new and an old genotype in respect to this. First, we didn't see any real change with year of release when you see the minimum year biomass to reach silking. And I'm only showing you the, some of the extremes. I'm not showing you all. Okay. But second, what we see, what we see is that the the new genomes have a slightly larger ear. But that is not that the differences are not that big. The main difference in when you compare an old and a new genotype is by how fast the ear biomass is accumulated and how fast silks are appearing. Newer genotypes have more ear biomass, and that makes you go in the x-axis much much faster. So the silks appear much faster. Okay. So this is an example. For these two genotypes, this is year biomass and time days after seal, after antisis. You can see the new genotype in here, more rapid year biomass, and, and, and an old genotype going with this uh, pattern of year biomass. And, I, and you can imagine, you know, going faster in the new genotype in the in the x-axis and slower in the x-axis of the old genotype. And of course. If you run that, you know, year biomass accumulation in the upper part, you have something like this. You have silk number and days after antisis, and the newer genotype, as it goes much faster, um, it, will, it will have a more rapid silk extrusion rate than, rather than the old genotype, okay? And, and, and we did this for all the genotypes, for the 32 genotypes under two growth environments. And what, what we did is we placed a time frame, okay? We want to know if this, you know, three-day window from the first pollinated silk to the three, three days after pollination, we don't care about the silks that are appearing late. If we could predict silk no, a kernel number based on that, and we tested it. And then the relationship was not that bad. I have to admit that I thought it was going to be a little better, but it, it's not that bad. I, um, so this is kernel number per plant at maturity for the 32 genotypes growing at two, um, this is the average for the two environments, and this is silk number at that specific uh, window of time. So, having said that, traditionally crop physiologists have always um, have always uh, related, you know, kernel number with year biomass growth or, or 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 year growth accumulation. And here we are trying to not place year growth and year biomass. We are trying to to link how many silks came out at a specific time point. So uh, we are trying to, to get the developmental issue uh, in the context of kernel cell. Having said that, um, a summary of what I have presented is that I have described you know, a, a functional relationship and some response curves between canopy growth, time to silk in, silk number, and kernel set. And this is what I call you know, trade dissection, going from, from a trade that is ASI and trying to connect it, functionally connect it to, to plant growth. And we, we describe some functional relationships in which you can later on, you know, do a QTL over the parameters or and place it in a model. Of course, with that, you can also start hypothesizing. And I, I, will, I, will, I will throw this, you know, so as to start some kind of discussion later on. But I like, I like this for thinking about, you know, a plant ideotype wish list within this framework. Um, what would I like if I if I if I wanted a if I had the possibility to have a to have a wish list? First, the most important, we want to sustain growth a stressful environment that can be deeper roots or it can be delaying water to to later stages, from vegetative to more reproductive stages. But it's it's very critical to sustain growth at particular uh, at stressful environments. 
Second, and we, we, don't, we don't hear about this much, but it's very critical to have uniform canopies. I went maybe a little, a little fast in, the, in the, the uniformity of the canopies, but this is, is really critical, especially at, at not at very good plant growth conditions, but at very bad plant growth conditions. Plant to plant variability really decreases yield. So a stressful environment is, are, the, are the environments in which you, you need to have very uniform canopies. Third, um, have, have um, good biomass. So that, that means good biomass partitioning. That means whenever there's a stressful situation in which the plants are not growing much, sustain the, the partitioning, the, the, how much biomass is going to the ear, right? We, we, we usually call it apical dominance, where we want the genotypes that don't have that much apical dominance and sustain ear growth at reduced growth condition. Fourth, Reach silking with a minimum year biomass, the minimum as possible, so that you reach silking as fast as possible. And of course, um, be efficient in the use of that year biomass for placing silks out. So, you know, be the, 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 ideal, um, the ideal year would be one that with minimum year biomass, you have silks quickly out um, within the husk, from the husk. So, Having said that, I am open to questions uh, later on. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. He's got two or three minutes there. Yes, right front. Go to the microphone, please. Anyone else? Adam Bortsidik from University of Western Australia. I enjoyed your talk, Lucas. I just wanted to know, when you say the plant growth rate per day, did you include the ear dry matter into that? Yes, yes. It, yeah. it, 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 it's always total plant growth, okay. and then from that total plant growth, how much is going to the ear? Yeah. So perhaps if you plot minus ear dry matter, then look at the leaf and stem, basically stem will have, you may get a different relationship. It might be, at reduced plant growth conditions, there are some genotypes that are not, and the genotypes that are not allocating biomass at the year, they are, bio, they are allocating biomass at somewhere else. Yeah, that's, Ma mainly, mainly the upper part of the stem and the tusk. That, that's what precisely I'm trying to say. Yeah. So if you look at the, the plant, basically the stem and a little bit of the leaf, dry matter, that growth rate versus the year, then you get a better ability to look at the partitioning coefficient. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the comment. Thank you, Lucas.